This video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you need a website, then you should definitely check out Squarespace and more on that later. Hey there, I'm out doing some client work today and I wanted to show you some of the stuff that I'm doing outside of YouTube. So my client is an architect who designs beautiful homes like this one here, which I'm gonna film after I talk to you. And so what I've been doing is filming one of these every week and creating vertical content for their Instagram page. So this is a little bit different from a lot of the stuff that you might see on Instagram for real estate and stuff like that. We're not doing listings, I'm doing stuff for the architect. And we're coming up with some kind of unique stuff. I think that's really cool and I wanted to share some of that with you in case you're interested in doing stuff like this, which may be able to apply to a lot of things outside of real estate and houses and stuff like that. But anyways, we're calling them cinematic reels. I don't really know what else to call them, <laughs> but I don't really like the term cinematic, but either way. So I'm gonna go shoot this house and then in this video, I'm gonna show you some of the gear that I use because I've dialed in my setup and I think it's pretty sweet. And then maybe in a future video, if you're interested, I will show you how I do this shooting and editing and all that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna go take care of this. I've just been waiting for the sun to creep around the front of the house. It looks pretty well lit. I'm gonna start shooting. All right, so I finished up all my drone work. I did all my gimbal work. I'm ready to wrap up the shoot and head home. You're probably wondering what I mean by cinematic reel. So I'm gonna head home and I'm gonna show you a little bit of this and then I'll talk about all the gear that I use so you can do something like this too. So that's an example of one of the reels. And as I said, I've been shooting these once a week for this entire year, so getting a lot of reps. And in terms of the music, I just wanna point out that that was requested from the client. So a lot of times you don't have say in that, so you're forced to use music they may not normally wanna use or think of using. And it can be challenging, but also can push you to be a little more creative at the same time. So that, I believe I got that from Epidemic Sound, but lately we've been using a lot of copyright music. And the way that I do that is I just, uh, edit the video to the music and then we upload it with no music and then we overlay the music in Instagram. So again, I'll talk about that later on in a separate video, like I said, in how I make all these videos. So here's another example just to show you. I really try to mix up the shots in terms of angles, focal lengths, drone, not drone, those sorts of things. It's been really cool and it's been a ton of fun and it's, I just wanna share this with you and I've really focused on getting my gear dialed in. So as I said, that's what I'm gonna show you in this video. So let's start by talking about the gear. So first of all, camera choice. This is the FX3 uh, and first, I just wanna talk about why I've been using the FX3. Now you could use a lot of different cameras here, but the reasons why I like the FX3 are the fact that we have full frame. So it's really great because I don't need super wide angle lenses and there's less distortion. There's also two card slots, which is great. It has great image quality, lots of dynamic range, fantastic autofocus, and it also has uncropped 4K60. So I am delivering in 1080, but having 4K60 is really nice. So the FX3 kind of checks all those boxes. I was also shooting on the a7 IV a little bit, and I did like that. I was just shooting in 1080, 60, and that works great too. But I've been really preferring the FX3 lately. In terms of lenses, I'm using the Sony 24 to 70 G Master Mark II. I know a lot of people when shooting on gimbals want to use a smaller prime lens. For me personally, this is all about speed. And now that the, the new G Master, the Mark II, is definitely a lot lighter than the first one, uh, I really do like it because I'm shooting most of my stuff at 24 millimeters and occasionally I sneak in a few shots at 50 millimeters. I don't always shoot everything at like F8 or F9. Sometimes I do open up the lens a little bit to get a little uh, depth of field play and when I'm creating um, 
depth in my shots using foreground elements. I like to blur those out and just have the ability to sort of play with the image a little bit more, I think stands out quite a bit than most of the sort of real estate stuff that you're seeing. So I've been using this lens and it's fantastic. And the filter on the front here is the Nisi True Color uh, one to five stop VND. I've talked about this in several other videos. That's my go-to filter. I know a lot of people that are shooting real estate tend to not use ND filters because there's a color shift and pretty much all of them have one, but this one I, is just awesome. I think it's a, a fantastic filter and is very, very clean. Uh, a lot of people will just crank the shutter and I've experimented, experimented with this too. And when you're shooting in 60 frames a second and you crank the shutter, you really can't notice very much, but I don't know. It just, just works better for me because I shoot all the stuff pretty much the same no matter what I'm shooting. I just adjust the aperture for what I'm looking for and then change the ND filter to get the right exposure. I leave the shutter speed double the frame rate. I think it just maybe gives it a little bit of an edge, but most people are not gonna notice. So it just, it keeps it consistent in terms of workflow. On the camera, I'm shooting in S-Log3 in Cine EI, so super, super simple. So that's basically it for the camera and lens, but uh, let's talk about the gimbal. So first of all, I have the RS2, and this, if you don't remember, I, is from the the second generation of the RS line. There's the RSC2, which is the medium, and the RS2 is the big one. That's kind of like the RS3 Pro. Now I haven't upgraded to the, the three series because this one works great. One thing I want to say about gimbals is that it's, I think it's always important to sort of have a bigger gimbal than you need because you can always add a little bit more weight to it. You can add a bigger lens. Uh, if you need to throw a bigger camera on there, it's great. It doesn't struggle. You don't have any jitters or anything. It's super smooth. I think there's a big push right now to get as small of a gimbal as possible, but I like it a little oversized for sure. And in terms of balancing it with the lens, no problem. I usually balance it somewhere between 35 and 50, so somewhere sort of in the middle and then I balance it and then it's good. I can just switch it back and forth for whatever I need and the gimbal can handle it no problem. But I do wanna point out about when you're mounting a camera vertically, there's a few different options. First of all, make sure you have like a cage or an L bracket or something on the camera that attaches in at least two places. When I tried to just put a plate on the bottom, you hold it here and like most of us just put the one screw in the bottom, it starts to twist forward or backwards, uh, usually forward I think. And so I noticed that pretty quickly and it was a major pain. So what I'm using here is Small Rig's new FX3, FX30 cage. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of cages in general. I try to keep things very minimal. This one is fairly lightweight and doesn't really get in the way very much. And it has an Arca Swiss on the bottom. So it slides right into the gimbal. So this has been working pretty well for me. It doesn't really restrict very much. Uh, I do like it. So this one attaches in three spots. So one on the bottom and then one on this side and also on this side. So it has three points. This cage isn't twisting at all. Now to mount this on the gimbal, there are a few different options. So first of all, this is the main uh, one that comes with the gimbal, and this works okay. You can um, add a, a plate or something on the edge of the camera, and then you can mount it like this. But what I found was that even when it's on the gimbal over here, it sort of keeps the weight much further over this way than I wanted to. And so what I found was this plate here, which I haven't heard a lot of people talking about, or not plate, this whatever you want to call this thing, bracket. <laughs> this is the DJI, DJI R vertical mount. And this is the normal like sled that comes in it, but this is the mount here. So you can see how much smaller it is versus uh, the main one that it comes with. And I, I love this. This has worked out really well. All right. So let me put this back on the gimbal here. And I just want to say that if you are doing this and you're making money with your camera, this is 50 bucks, totally worth it in my opinion. I think it makes a, a lot better of a, a combination here and just feels a lot better when you're trying to fly a camera vertically because it's kind of awkward. Um, and so this just slides in right here. And as I said before, I just think it really balances a lot better. It's like the weight is much right more over the center of the gimbal. So uh, yeah, anyways, that's how I mount the camera. Okay, so the other things going on here, the, we have the handles here. These are the DJI handles and it comes with a left and a right. So I can slide this one on here. I actually have them backwards. So this is actually the right one. I'm using it on the left. And the reason for that is I don't use this. I don't use a handle on the right. So when I got this, I set it up like this because this does feel really amazing. The problem I was having was that I was using the trigger record here. So I was constantly, I'm doing short takes. So I'm like, I'll do, a, I'll hit record. I'll do, a, I'll do a move, do a few seconds and then I have to stop. And then I have to switch my hands around. So if I was filming, I'd hit record and then I'd have to like do this kind of move 
and then start shooting. So I just eliminated the right handle uh, for simplicity and also for weight. One thing that's great about this handle system, if you do have the left on the left, is that you can mount it this way, which would be on the back, and then you can use it for briefcase mode and stuff. This is a really cool set. If you are using uh, the DJI system, I highly recommend these handles. They're fantastic. But I just mounted the right one, as I said, on the left is what you see here. And this allows me to hold the camera, sorry, hold the gimbal just like this. And um, it's my arms are not quite at shoulder width, but it's a lot more comfortable than trying to do the, the one-handed hold because I really don't like the one-handed hold. It gets pretty tiring. Also, I need to place some out my monitor. So this is working really well. In terms of the monitor, I'm using the Atomos Shinobi. And I was using the Ninja V for a while, but I decided to pick up Shinobi because they basically have the same image in terms of brightness and sharpness, both the Ninja V and the Shinobi. But the Shinobi is like half the weight and uses less battery power and it's just a much more simple device. So I do like that. I think they're a great value. I don't think they're the best monitors out there, but in terms of finding a monitor that's bright enough to see outside, this is a great option. And, and the other thing is you can load custom LUTs in here. So the FX3 can add custom LUTs that you can add to your footage while you're shooting. But if you don't have a camera that can do that, you can do that in the monitor. So that's really handy if you want to you see it a little bit more colored in or if there's a LUT that you use all the time, you can view it with that while you're shooting. So that's fantastic. Uh, in terms of the batteries, I'm using the medium size NPF batteries. I think they're like the 750s. I would like to try it with a smaller battery because these last way more than a whole shoot. So maybe I could save some weight and get a smaller one. Uh, but this is what I've been rolling with so far. In terms of the mount, I'm using this small rig magic arm here, which is great. I can get it exactly where I want. I lock it down, doesn't go anywhere. And in terms of my shooting style, I hold it like this. I can see the monitor. I don't have the HDMI settings on the external monitor. I leave those on the back of the camera. And so if I am setting exposure, I look over the camera, check my histogram, adjust the aperture and the ND, get that dialed in. If I need to do tap to focus, I just do that on the back of the screen. I come over and start shooting. I hit record and I can see it really well. And so one thing I have to say is that now I've gotten into the habit of using a monitor when I'm out shooting video. It has made a huge difference. So if you're not in the habit of using an external monitor and you're relying on the little Sony screens, this is a huge upgrade. Not only you have a lot more confidence, but you're gonna get better shots because you're gonna be able to see what you're doing. The Sony LC screens, as most of you know, are not very good. And also it's really hard to see them when you are uh, shooting outside on a gimbal as well. So in terms of the cabling here, I have this lightweight small rig cable. It is rather short, which I like because it's really tidy. Uh, this doesn't get in the way of any of the moves I'm doing because I'm not doing very complicated moves. So this one's been good. I also have a longer one in case I need to do that. And this cable here is the USB-C cable that comes with the gimbal. So it goes from the gimbal to the camera. And this allows me to do uh, run stop. I can hit the record button on and off, which as I said before, I'm doing pretty often. So that's the gimbal setup. So I use this setup, I get probably about half the shots for each of the reels. And a big part of the footage that I'm getting is by using a drone. So before we get on talking about my drone recommendations and what I like to use, I need to take a moment to talk about this video sponsor, which is Squarespace. If you're a creative, a content creator, or a small business owner, you need a website. Believe me, you really do. I'm really excited to have Squarespace sponsor this video because I've been personally using Squarespace for years. Now your website can be as simple as a landing spot for people to find your contact info and social media, but it's also a great place to show off your photos, videos, portfolio, artwork, etc. They even let you host videos directly. There's no need to link a YouTube or Vimeo video and it looks a lot more professional and seamless. It's simple to set up a website with their amazing templates. They make it super easy and anyone can do it pretty quickly. They have lots of other cool stuff like the ability to set up an online store, to schedule appointments, or have member areas. You should definitely head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Josh Satin to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Link in description. All right, so now let's talk about drones. And I can't make a full comparison about all these drones, but what I wanna do is give you a little bit about my experience with these drones and also why I decided to go with the ones I went with. So. First of all, the Air 2S, I've had this drone for a while now. It is awesome, great image, 10-bit video, decent dynamic range, decent size sensor, super easy to fly. I don't really have any complaints about the Air 2S. I think it's a great value. Even though it's a little bit older of a drone now, I still think it's a great drone. One thing that bothers me is that I was using this controller and I had to use my phone all the time, which just adds friction and all that kind of stuff. And so that was bothering me about this. But I heard a lot of good things about this guy here. This is the Mini 3 Pro. 
and I had a lot of friends that were using this and saying it was it was great. I've all seen a lot of great reviews about it, and it is a very cool drone. It does have its limitations though, but the main reason I picked it up was the fact that it can shoot vertical video. So the camera will flip over and you can shoot vertical, which you get a full resolution. You don't have to crop to get it and you can get really good framing while you're shooting, which is awesome. I also picked it up with the controller that has the screen on it, which has been an absolute game changer. This is a huge uh, quality of life improvement. If you haven't already picked up one of these, I really do recommend getting one with the screen. It's easy to see, it links up immediately. It, it's awesome, I really like that. Now my complaints about the Mini 3 Pro, Although it does produce a 10 bit image, it has a pretty small sensor and the colors and stuff are great out of this camera. And you just gotta be really careful with the exposure because this doesn't shoot in logs. So you have to really nail the exposure and otherwise you're gonna clip the highlights or, or cross the shadows. But I've gotten really great images out of this. But while flying this for several times, the issues I had with this drone is it is incredibly light. Now that's great for packing it away, transportation. It's tiny, it fits in lots of places. But when I'm out flying and it gets a little bit windy, even just a little bit windy, it's really hard to control the drone in very precise movements. Now, if I was out shooting landscapes and stuff like that where it's not as precise, I think that would be fine. But for me, I'm trying to get these very precise cinematic shots on houses. I, I need it to be very accurate. And I noticed that I would just like move the thing forward and backwards, it would be in, in a different spot. And also there was days where it just it was a little bit breezy and sometimes the drone couldn't even move around because it was like fighting against the wind. So I had a lot of trouble with just the movement on the drone, but I think it is a very good drone, especially for the money. And the other thing it doesn't have are side sensors and I'm always flying at weird angles. So I do like having that, um, that safety net that it's gonna warn me if I'm gonna smack into something. So that's really good. But overall, uh, I tended to move on from this and I picked up the Mavic 3 Classic. This drone is a beast. I absolutely love it. And in case you're curious about why I have tape on this, I'm just covering up my FAA sticker. So I do have my part 107 and I got it years ago. And I recommend that if you are doing any drone work for money, so either like a gig work, or if you're putting um, content on YouTube, that is actually considered professional work because you're getting paid from YouTube for those videos and they're, because they're monetized, you do need a part 107 by law. So make sure you get into that if you're doing that kind of stuff. I highly recommend it. It's not super hard. You can study and, and do it and get your license and, and all that sort of stuff. So just wanna say, I, I have a part 107. I register all my drones. You should definitely do that if you're doing this professionally. So the Mavic 3 Classic is awesome for a lot of reasons. It, I have used the Mavic 2 Pro before and it reminds me of that too. Uh, I didn't want to have deal with the zoom lens. I, I didn't think I needed that. I just wanted one really good lens. The image is just absolutely stunning out of this. It's 10 bit, you have a big sensor. Uh, it actually shoots in log, which is great. And the other thing which I didn't get in the Mini 3 Pro is the ability to change the aperture. So while you're flying, you know, you can change the exposure with the aperture instead of having to rely on shutter speed because I do put an ND filter on it and you guess roughly what the, you know, the exposure is gonna be, but when you get up there, there's always changes. So I love that ability. It flies really well, it's heavy in the sky, it's very stable, it has lots of sensors on it. This thing is just so easy to fly, it's unbelievable. And the one struggle that I have with it is it doesn't shoot vertical, which hasn't really been an issue because you can shoot in the 5.1K mode and I just eyeball the, um, the framing. So I use the three by three grid on the screen and then I shoot a little bit wider than that. So three by three, if you use that center section, is not quite nine by 16. So you just shoot a little bit wider and you get the framing. You just get used to it after after you do a couple shoots. Uh, I've been using this for a little while now and I highly recommend the Mavic 3 Classic. Another thing I wanna mention about drones is having ND filters. So like I do for my camera, I have an ND filter on there so I can keep my shutter speed locked in. I do the same thing with the drone. And as I said before, if you're shooting 60 frames per second, you can often just crank the shutter and probably no one's gonna notice because you're gonna slow it down. But I shoot in real time, I shoot in 24 frames per second. So I like having ND filters. And I'm using the ones from DJI and I it comes in a four pack. I'm generally using the 32 when it's a sunny day, but these have been pretty good. I haven't really noticed any serious color shifts or anything. So. ND filters are awesome. And uh, because I can change the aperture through the drone, I guess roughly where I'm gonna be at, send it up there and I can make the exposure changes on the fly. Lastly, I wanna talk about storage and transportation. I highly recommend picking up a nice hard case like this. And for me personally, I'm just driving from my house. When I go shoot these, I just go out for the day and come back. So I'm not getting on a plane or anything like that. Having a nice case to keep yourself organized and keep yourself protected while you're driving is fantastic. This is the Nanook 950. This is my favorite case for sure. There's a bunch of reasons. It's super durable. It's got a really nice, it got really nice handles. Also like a handle that you can pull up. 
Um, it wheels really well. It's also just a beast. I love this thing. And one thing I like specifically about the 950 is that it's a lot deeper. And so you can like stand up lenses and other stuff that would take up less sort of real estate in the case because you don't, you don't have to lay everything on its side. And so you get a lot more stuff in this. And I'm not bringing this on a plane, so a little bit of height is, is great. So I highly recommend this. And I just work out of the back of my car. And having everything in here, I can just bring it in and set it up and then just take out the case. It's, it's just awesome. I also have the 935, which I like too. It's just uh, not as tall and you can take them on an airplane and stuff. So I really like the Nanook cases. Maybe I'll do a review about this at some point. I really, <laughs> I really like these cases. They've been awesome. Uh, anyways, I will leave a link in the description for all the gear mentioned if you wanna check any of that stuff out. Also, I wanna thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. I wanna thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, please hit subscribe down below. It'd be greatly appreciated. We'll see you in the next one.